Okay, so we can go ahead and get started. Uh, so good afternoon, um, everyone. Welcome to uh, our session, uh, Shana and I's session on disrupting colorblind teacher education in computer science. So I'm Dominic Sanders. Uh, currently, I serve as the uh, Computer Science State Supervisor for um, South Carolina Department of Education. And um, I'm also a CSTA um, Equity Fellow as well. Good afternoon, good evening. Good early afternoon, depending on where you are. I'm Shana Glass, and I am currently a Technology Applications and STEM Program Director in Audi Independent School District, which is located in Houston, Texas. Um, feel free to connect with me. These are my areas of focus and emphasis. And I, too, am a CSTA Equity Fellow. All right. So again, um, this session is um, entitled Disrupting Colorblind Teacher Education and Computer Science. So the first thing we wanted to know from you all, um, pre pretty much just a, a pulse check. So have you all seen your state's reports um, in regards to um, AP Computer Science Access and Participation? Um, and is there anything that um, kind of surprised you about um, those results? Um, he's using an example from Florida. I can definitely speak on my state. I'm from Texas. And overall, we are lacking um, as far as students taking AP computer science exams. We have st um, a hefty number of students who are, but students that are black and brown, the percentage is low. So they, they do replicate uh, very similar to what Florida's um, report is showing. And then um, here in the state of South Carolina, so we have the computer science uh, computer science as a, a graduation requirement. So all students have to at least take one section. So in our uh, intro courses, especially our web page uh, fundamentals course, a lot of students are taking that to fulfill their requirement. Um, in regards to our AP courses, um, there of course is more work um, that needs to be done, especially even when you think about like AP CSA, we hardly have um, any students um, of color, especially taking the AP CSA course. So we're adding this just to show the percentage of underrepresented students um, and the percentage who are actually taking computer science in schools. This is just showing that they're far less likely to offer computer science. I know that that's changing state to state. I know that here in Georgia, well, there in Georgia, you guys are getting ready to change that. I know the, that everyone's been paying attention to Arkansas and what they're doing, uh, what South Carolina is doing. Um, across the country, people are making the change to make computer science um, at least a requirement to take computer science in high school, and some are going even further. All right, so um, when you all think of like racism, what is like the first thing um, that comes to mind? So some of you all may think about like the KKK or some of you all may think about like Rosa Parks or other different um, historic events. So when you think of racism, oh, what comes to mind? So Shannon, for you, when you think of racism, what comes to mind? Hmm. Yeah, I would take a deep breath on it. Um... When I think of racism, I do think of those against others that don't look like them. Those who oppose the mindset, the progression of those that don't look like them. And yeah, that's my that's my initial thought when I think of racism. Gotcha. Yeah, I'm pretty much in the same vein. And then like some of the questions that I have for um, the individuals in the room. So do you do you believe that we are past the racism or do you think that it's still something prevalent in our society? Um, maybe you claim that you don't see race or everyone isn't is uh, the same. 
So if you claim that you do not see race or everyone is the same, if you're doing this, you are actually subscribing to a type of racism referred to as a color blindness. So in that vein, um, these are three statements. Uh, so have you used these three statements? Uh, so the first one, people are people. I don't see race. Um, I only see uh, one race, the human race. And then the last one says, I, I don't think of you as black or you can also add you know, any other race to that. I see you as a person just like um, you and me. So statements like these are very um, harmful. Um, the reason why these uh, statements are harmful because these send a message that we all have the same dreams, the same values, the same struggles, and also the same worries. And that notion of not seeing race or being colorblind serves to negate cultural values and lived experience of individuals from diverse backgrounds. So Shannon, you go ahead, can you read this one for me? Sure. Our job is to prepare students for to enter the society. And society is in fact not colorblind. And people who say that they don't see race um, as something to be feared, it should actually be embraced. Um, I'm just curious of those who are in the room, who has um, who have who has or who have experienced someone saying that they've not they don't see race. I see people. Because I've, I've heard that. I hear that quite often, especially from younger people. Um, I don't know. I forgot the name of their generation. Is it X, V, Z? Yeah, uh. <laughs> but the, the, there's younger generations that feel that they don't see race. Or there's people who are older who now tend to avoid the conversation. They say they don't see race. Right. And then um, just to piggyback off of that. So like um, if you're not seeing race, um, especially when you're thinking about um, the students that you teach, if you're not seeing race, you still need to know um, the perception of seeing race of the students. Um, to prepare them for a society that will, because even though you may not see race at the end of the day, um, as a society, we have not got um, to that point yet. So you still need to um, engage um, your students because again, in the society, people will see their race before they see um, anything else. And also some of the current events that have been happening are just an examples um, of that. So this, this image may speak volumes. It is the def defining what colorblindness is. It is the ideology where one claims that they don't see skin. Um, and those who follow color the colorblind way of thinking don't think that someone's culture or background should, should change their insight or should change the insight of, of anyone in their lives. And so there's a lot of people who they just can't see. And I, I'm a stickler on can't. Um, not that you can't see, you don't want to see. So. All right, so um, some of the challenges um, when we think about like um, how does colorblindness um, show up for us in like the classroom. Um, so we talk about like um, structural opportunities, so course availability, um, course credit, uh, prepared teachers, student opportunities to learn um, computer science, and then also like teachers just not being aware of schools wide structures and systems that continue to create um, inequities. Um, so some of those can be, again, like when we're talking about like course availability, depending on what school district you're at, not all schools in your district may offer um, computer science. Uh, credit. Some schools may only offer um, an AP computer science credit, but however, if you're at one of those, as they call them, AP for all, AP schools, if your students are not on the AP track, they never get a chance to um, take computer science. So all of those different things um, 
show um, the color blindness and then also the belief systems. That's one of the biggest uh, geek gate, gate, sorry, goodness, biggest gatekeepers for students who don't demonstrate a preparatory privilege. So again, um, believing that like not all students can learn computer science where of course we know um, otherwise that computer science is for everyone. Um, everyone, we all understand that everyone may not major in computer science, but computer science is like the pillar to all the different careers, no matter of uh, any career choice, you will have to um, be privy to computer science and those different um, technologies that are a part of computer science. Um, before you switch, I want to talk about the other structural opportunities and um, issues that we we face here that I'm I'm curious if others are facing in their area. Not only is it the AP gatekeepers, it's also mathematics um, as prereqs. Um, this is a created um, blind spot that we are seeing and facing here in Texas is lots of students you know, we offer computer science starting at kindergarten now. We're starting earlier, but alongside that, students need to become stronger in mathematics or the systems need to change on the options of what is provided uh, to strengthen alongside them learning. Uh, which computational thinking, we know that that is embedded in computer science, but when students finish middle school and they've taken computer science and they go to high school, if they don't have the prereq of Algebra 1, then they're halted because that's a prereq and that's a problem. Um, I, I feel like that just needs to be completely dismantled, um, that there shouldn't be a prereq from mathematics. As I hearing other conversations earlier today, even in a panel discussion that was taking place, I think that was during lunch, um, that students are seeing seeing these courses as alternatives to mathematics, to straight up mathematics courses, because it's embedded and it's taught within the context. So these structural barriers should be considered opportunities. It's just, it's a problem that needs a solution, which to me is removal. <laughs> but but I'm a, I'll stop and digress, not digress. <laughs> <laughs> so, the next one, uh, so just reframing um, the colorblind um, ideology. So pretty much just like shifting uh, one's perspective. So how you shift one's perspective. So you're thinking about the words that you choose to describe things, uh, people, any events, and how uh, we think about them. Uh, reframing from language and expanding perspective can also help us think differently about the students um, that we teach. So in another slide later on, we'll definitely um, dive a little bit deeper um, in regards to uh, reframing um, the colorblind ideologies. So when addressing race consciousness, when reframing the colorblind narrative, introduce the term race consciousness. Edu educators concerned with equity, we have to see each other's unique qualities so we can acknowledge and address the inequality and injustice that has been perpetuated based on these differences. So let's celebrate students and what makes them unique. Um, I actually was having a conversation about this, about uh, bringing in, how do you bring in cultural relevance in, into your CS classroom by bringing in you. Uh, when you let down your guards and you share about your cultural, your cultural beliefs and your upbringing, um, a part of who you are, then kids become more comfortable, regardless of the color of your skin, to be able to share what's going on in their community, in their lives. Um, and it embraces their beauty. So it's important to create those what I call unicorn moments. Show them that show them how they are that unicorn, you know, embrace, embrace your melanin in all shades. And then I know I lack their look and lack thereof. <laughs> and I know for me um, in the classroom, one thing that I did, um, I had um, posters on the wall, but I had 
all different shades of um, individuals on the wall. So that way everyone can make sure that, you know, they felt like that computer science was for them. It was a safe space. And then I also even went a step further. So at the beginning of the year, once you get um, your roster, um, or also if you guys have power school, so my school uses power school, we could also um, see the initiative of the students. And then, um, also figuring out like their race. So what I did was one step further, I created a calendar. So like important dates for them in, in regards to their culture, whether it was Ramadan or whatever was going on, if it was Hanukkah, if it was Kwanzaa, those were on the calendar. So then I knew like during that week or during that day, I would do my homework on um, whatever it is. And then that would be like the theme for the day. So if it was, if we were talking about International Flag Day, or we, again, if we were talking about like Kwans or anything, the PowerPoint would be sitting around there, still do the do now and everything. And then I would also embed like their culture into um, the curriculum. So that way, not only do those students uh, feel supported, but it's also a learning experience um, for everyone else in the room. So then we all are this one unit or one body. I love that. Something I'm going to piggyback on that uh, for one statement. Um, this came up about a couple months ago, too, where we asked students the question, do you see yourself reflected in what you're learning? Do you see your culture embedded in what you're learning? I think what you did was excellent because um, you embedded them into what they were learning. Not necessarily that it was a computer programmer or it was just more so let's talk about you and how you want to be seen in this room. I think uh, a recommendation to teachers and educators in general is to continuously, continuously ask students how would they see what what's impacting their lives and their community be seen in a computer science classroom. Like what you're learning, how could that be applicable applicable to your your neighborhood? Like what 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 could you do with this today to be applied tonight or tomorrow or this weekend or next week in your community? Because that's the way that they see those connections. You know what I mean? So yeah, about to say, and in that same vein, those were always um, my favorite um, projects to grade um, because I would always um, make sure that I was very intentional on the projects that I put in front of my kids, but then also always making sure that they were able to freely um, express themselves. So I would keep the project as generic as possible. So if I'm looking for conditional statements or if I'm looking for, you know, whatever I'm looking for, that would be pretty much the only criteria. Hey, hey your project, give me tr uh, three conditional statements. The rest of it is, hey, let's tailor this project back to your community. Tailor this project about to a favorite experience that you've had. Tailor this back to um, your favorite entertainment artist or your favorite movie show. So that way they were able to pretty much see themselves in the curriculum and expand on their own learning. So examining implicit bias. I don't know if you all have ever got a chance um, to take the um, implicit uh, association test. Um, that's the link, uh, Shana, we may be, yeah, thank you. Yeah, so on there they have, they have a ton of different um, biased um, quick um, quizzes that you can take. And um, they're very, um, they're very, uh, good to take um, because sometimes you don't even know that you have these different biases, but then by you taking a quick um, quiz, it also helps you that way when you are in those situations, you're um, able to address your discomfort a little easier. Absolutely. So some of them are just like pictures, like when you see this picture, like what do you think? And it may have like four different things um, on the screen. and. They are time, so it's pretty much trying to gather um, gather upon what's your like initial thinking, your thoughts. Sure. So I'm going to give an example um, to answer her question about student work to connections meaningful to them. So I participated in a student panel about two months ago where we included students 
um, and ask them specifically how did they see themselves in in their work. And one student, um, he was Jamaican. He was like, "I bring in, I bring in my culture. So I bring in the foods, I bring in the music, um, in whatever it is we're learning." Um, now, this student was a self starter. I know we have a lot of kids in this generation. It's certainly hard for them to. I'm not gonna say hard. I'm not gonna lie for the kids. <laughs> I'm not gonna, like I'm not gonna lie for the kids, but. Um, that's why I mentioned about, I personally mentioned about teachers bringing in uh, a little bit about you. Kids need to be able to build trust, especially in something that they're uncomfortable in. Even you showing, you being vulnerable as well. So showing your vulnerability to share about you. Then they will, you can then ask them to incorporate that. So keeping, keeping that in mind that it's important for you to bring both to make your culture really relevant. It's important for you to show the connections from all cultures, not I, just your, not just you know one. And I think a good way um, to do that in the classroom is the um, I do you do model. So even if you are using a um, block curriculum, take the time out to edit that example and make it make it your standalone so make it like culturally relevant that it's yours so if you're having them talk about you know maybe you're having your students create uh, an app about their favorite restaurant pick a restaurant that's your favorite restaurant so then they can kind of see as you're coding it okay well this is my favorite restaurant these are the different menu items on the restaurant these are the different screens that i know at my restaurant of course this restaurant is five star. So at the end of my app, I'm definitely going to have to have a tip because every time I've been at this restaurant, I've had five star service. I've now, now that I've created my app, now let's go ahead and you create your app on your favorite restaurant. So let's talk about mistakes that are often made. Um, sometimes we place students in situations where we ask them to speak specifically for or be the rep for their culture. You know, some people call that being a token. <laughs> <laughs> but are we really embracing diverse perspectives if one student is the spokesman for their ethnic, ethnic group or, um, or their race or their gender? Um, Instead, can create instruction around the broadest, most global conceptual con uh, t target and then design opportunities for students to connect their own ideas, which is what Dominic literally just said. Instead of making it this one thing, start off with something broad that they all can relate to um, so that then they can all put their own spin on it. Um, we recently had students develop apps like the the focus of this this conference is CS for Good, social good. So we had students to develop apps that would impact the community, and many of them did it off of food deserts. Um, our school district is the entire district over 100 square miles um, is sitting in a food desert. So they were coming up with ideas to modify or improve um, on what is status quo. And several students came up with variations to that of how they see to eliminate the food deserts in their area. And it was very interesting because my district sits in a food desert, but the neighboring district that they were competing against is affluent, right? So, all the kids look the same on camera, but they come from completely different areas. And the perspectives were vast because not that the students in the affluent districts didn't know how they could handle food waste. And, you know, they did their research and they had these ideas, yet the students who actually live it, who have to travel to this affluent area to the grocery store, because it's not one that prov provides fresh produce in their neighborhood, their perspectives were very different. Same 
less than 10, mi- 10 miles, if that. Very different. I'm going to let down uh, speak on speak that. No, no, you're smart. <laughs> when, um, I know like in my earlier years when I still was in the classroom, that was one of the things that I pretty much had like a spokesperson. So, but then as the years went on, I realized that like that person can't be the spokesperson because if they're black, if they're Asian, their experience will be totally different from someone else. I, um, the last school I worked at, it was a charter school. You had some people that were very privileged. You had other kids that weren't um, very privileged, but in my earlier years, because it was a charter school and you know kids were getting bussed in, you know, that, oh yeah, I'm, everybody's having the same lived experience, but they're not having the same experience. So that um, was one of the mistakes that I know for myself. Um, as a teacher, I often did um, make, make um, in my earlier years. So now we're going to um, talk about some of the um, best practices. So adopt the uh, K-12 computer science uh, framework. Shane, do you want to speak on the frameworks? Sure. Um, critically engage in public discussions on uh, computer science topics that, like we're doing right now. Not just we're doing it in conferences. I know a lot of people do it on social media. Um, there's lots of opportunities to write articles, to participate in various format, like um, not just articles, but uh, creating blogs, participating in podcasts. I know some some people do that too. Um, <laughs> um, developers, learners, users, um, and creators of computer science work to support uh, the development of curriculum. So reach out and network with lots of people who are here in this this uh, this summit, connect with them to help to enhance and give different diverse perspectives in the content that's being developed. Help the, the creating a framework will help you better understand the role of computing. Partner with people from all walks of life, not just those in education, but in industry. Also, um, I keep now digging and reaching to community colleges and uh, universities. I'm gonna say it again, community colleges, because they're that bridge, right? Everybody's talking about uh, dual um, dual credit, providing dual credit opportunities. These things help to build a computer science framework. I know there's some people in here, look at cs for all um, definitely reach out to them about how to develop a more comprehensive computer science framework. Reach out to your Department of Education uh, because they too will help support schools and school systems and school districts and charter schools to help you develop a computer science framework. Re- reference and refer back to those state and national um, organizations and departments of ed that are working to develop a framework and mirror that for your school district. Um, And in some cases, it can even be scaffolded down to be mirrored in your classroom and at your campus. So the next one, um, just said post personal growth goals um, relates to equity. So like three simple things that you can say, like I can recognize a uh, privilege in society and organizations. I understand how white privilege affects me and others. And then I recognize um, various kinds of racism. So these are just like three um, quick statements that like when you go into the room or as you are designing um, lessons uh, for students in your classroom, you can literally just keep these three things in mind. This will also help you um, as you are navigating um, your equity journey or disrupting your colorblindness um, journey as well. It's important for you to conduct an equity audit. Look at different research that has been done by other educators um, and by by those within your professional learning network. Relate back to your own personal experiences. Think back to uh, one of our equity fellows, he's made this statement, have you ever been the only one? Um, I, I, when he said it, I can't let it go. I actually I'll say it uh, almost daily. Um, think of a time when you've been the only one, whether that is uh, by your ethnicity, um, by race, by gender, by disability. Um, 
definitely <laughs> definitely um look into that solicit thoughts from trusted individuals aka thought partner partners this has been the biggest the, the new word <laughs> about um re creating relationships to build thought partners push to reform instructional practices not just globally within your own immediate circle there's lots of things that are good and research-based and there's lots of things that don't work for everybody and for uh that aren't weren't designed to reach all students examine as we mentioned at the very beginning examine your school state and national data it's out there um, in some cases, I wouldn't recommend it, but in some cases, you can do a Wikipedia search. I get a pull up and <laughs> tell you. Um, I mean, and it's not a bad thing, but you, but you you should definitely become your own private eye. I'm definitely an investigative reporter. I will dig and dig and dig and dig some more. Um, I'll give her a call. Sorry about that. And then how an example is how teachers actions and school policies policies contribute to the production of patterns and data. And Lynn, I do see your question. <laughs> and she's asking, what are your thoughts on the, the uh, well, you see it on the critical race theory as related to equity in computer science education? And ironically, we had a conversation earlier today about the critical race theory. Um, in computer science and how how and where that should lie um, when it comes to speaking on equity in computer science. Dominic, you want to start us off? Yeah, she's, so, she's asked the question. Yeah, so um, in a nutshell, what we talked about earlier is um, figuring out, number one, like what are the policies that are actually policy and what are just things that are just like your admin um, preferences. And then um, another thing that we talked about, because um, we had uh, individuals earlier that were thinking about like starting different clubs, but they weren't able to start those different clubs. So using the language of underrepresented um, students, that's how you're still going to be able to get your target numbers, for example, for your class, or if you're trying to target it for your club, because again, this is just the data that you're using. You don't have to, throw around the buzzwords that um, everybody is looking for. But if you're going out there and saying, hey, I'm starting a club after school for my underrepresented students in CS, that's how you're still gonna be able to get, you know, your numbers, your data, the students that you're really trying to target um, based on the demographics um, of your school. I'm gonna piggyback off of that. And I'm gonna say, um, definitely bringing in components of bringing in data as he spoke on underrepresented your yeah, underrepresented populations look at it also from the social eco, socioeconomic aspect as well um but not just us holding a conversation about it it's about how do you teach kids and how do you include that it that computer science needs to become more equitable across the board seeing as though we need to make it more equitable to have teachers that look like the students they serve that from there those who are in admin uh, that look like them those in the profession that look like them those who are professors and teach it in on the university level that that look like them because those are that it has to be inclusive well if you struggle with trying to uh, bring that in or there may be some conflicts where you can't where they say it is prohibited then also step back and teach students about the biases teach students how to identify bias and through teaching that you you can't leave out yourself so you'll be addressing bias so then that will lead to more questions. And if they ask questions that you are unable or maybe even don't know how to answer, then show them how to become those data scientists and start to research it themselves. Because you can't, we can't hide the truth. Or let's say Google won't hide the truth. <laughs> so there's ways around it, but it's important 
to create this this tight woven circle of information to help them get it mm-hmm. and use it as a, a teaching lens to get help them get it even if you're prohibited from actually directly teaching it please drop in the chat any feedback or questions that you may have in regards to this because yeah <laughs> so okay yeah so now we're click so just confronting um colorblindness so we all know that most of us have been exposed to the narratives that norm- normalize and equity um, ignore racial history and attributes to desperate life outcomes uh, to personal character beliefs. Um, and we talked about PD and equity earlier. Um, so that can be a, a very great way um, to figure out um, the transparent colorblind language and behaviors uh, to fostering more equitable um, school school in general. And then also you can always ask yourself, these are some more questions that um, as you are teaching of some of the questions you can ask yourself. So the first one, does our language move the conversation in direction in the direction of behavior language, self-examination or personal responsibility to dismantle inequitable practices? Or does it serve to deflect from racism, shift the focus and offer no meaningful way to um, meaningful way to address disparities? Yes, I see the question as well. I was listening to you, but but I'm reading I'm reading our questions and comments in the chat. I think, yeah, that is on the ridiculous end. So, but let's let's dig a little deeper. So let's talk about these resources, um, some of the resources that were provided. So we had a chance to talk with the fabulous Nikki, Dr. Wick, Nikki Washington. And she provided us with a list of books as there's always more books and resources. Um, I'm dropping that in the chat, I gotcha. Oh, okay, thank you. But she actually provided us with some of these books that she provides to her undergrad students um, to, to help you gain more knowledge um, on disrupting colorblind teacher education. So, um, specifically, well, it's not specifically in computer science, but it's to get the conversation to get your juices flowing. So we wanted to pass that along to you, to you all. Yeah, and then like um, my favorite one is Stuck in the Shallow Ends. If you guys have never um, read any of Jane's work or seen her, she's a frequent um, person at like CSTA uh, conferences and stuff. She is a um, phenomenal um, person, phenomenal resource. Um, so if you haven't read any of her works or her publishings, uh, I would highly suggest that um, you do so. We also included Your Voice is Power, um, the Amazon Future Engineer program. It literally just closed for the competition on Juneteenth, where students were programming. Um, they were using programming for um, music. The students were programming music to share their voice. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Pretty cool. And that's, um, that was the um, Georgia Tech um, Music for Ear sketch. So if you have not checked out the Music for Ear sketch, um, that's also a, another way to um, promote equity in your classroom. And then also another way just to get students um, interested in computer science because everybody loves music. So that's a, a good universal. Music. Yeah, music is a, is a universal. I can't talk today. <laughs> So our last slide just says um, the change doesn't happen overnight. However, we can change the tra- trajectory of our students if we demonstrate the courage um, to take a stand. So we're moving fast uh, for the time, but um, today's session was we did bring bring you today's session with all of our information so you can connect with us. We do want to come back and address some of the, the questions in the chat and address any questions that you have for us. Um, 
I do want to, to kind of discuss the questions and comments that were placed in the chat and ask you to continue to add um, as this is our time we would like to dig a little deeper and if any of you would like to come on to the stage um, and join us in the conversation feel free actually I want to go back up and dominate you were talking so you didn't get a chance to uh, address David's comment in the chat, which I think is really interesting. I think it was the first time I've I've heard this. Um, some uh, critical race theory advocates say that getting the right answer on math problems is racist. Um, and he was asking if requiring your C plus code to compile was racist. Like, is that is it racist for math? I would like to know more. Thank you so much for sharing the article. Um, yeah, I definitely read that. Yeah, to cancel math classes, I'm trying to understand how that would be considered racist. And Lynn, I've seen you post uh, in the chat as well in regards to that. Um, I think I would have to agree that I think that that's, I'm, I'm not understanding how solving a math problem makes you racist. That. Yeah, um, David, do you want to come on screen? Yeah, I can. I can see it being heated. I think. I think the whole conversation on addressing race in the classroom now is a very heated conversation. <laughs> hey, David, how are you? Good. Good. How are you? Good. So just to clarify, uh, what these people are saying is that an emphasis on getting the right answer is racist. And it's a minority view, but when, when people object to critical race theory, this is the kind of thing they're objecting to. It's not, they're not saying that you can't teach concepts about you know, fairness and justice and equity but it's possible to go too far. And a lot of people think that this view, that uh, requiring students to turn in homework on time, requiring math students actually get the right answer. Um, another one was um, asking students to show their work um, in a math class. Um, there was a huge national controversy about this back in February um, when California was considering adopting these revised math standards. And that's what people are objecting to. I just gotcha. want to clarify that. Thank you, David. Um, <laughs> so I get what you're saying. And I see that um, I think it just goes it just goes deeper. And I don't see that as race because I think the situation with homework and, you know, you know, understanding where they come from, if that is something that that was that's a universal issue, not a just a race quote unquote issue, um, and it may not be race at all. It may be socioeconomic, you know, depending on which you know you. There's so many factors that play in, and there's so much data to back up it being just you know legitimate. Let's say to be focused just on on one aspect. So I wouldn't I wouldn't dismiss this opinion from the Wall Street Journal. Um, and what they're talking about, dismantling racism in mathematics instruction, maybe not the, not the direct angle, but look at all of the data and the impact besides just saying it is tied to race. And that this is one way to relieve that or eliminate this. Not that this is you at all, right? This is someone else's opinion this is this is a conversation that's being had there's gonna a lot of it's gonna be a lot of rabbit holes though that come down to create excuses as to why we shouldn't and that people are gonna say that this is this is the cause they're gonna say that they don't want to do this because of race so they're gonna they're gonna say they don't want to do no no one is saying that what they are they quote unquote whoever they is will or won't but don't limit it to be because of race because mm -hmm. that's not what that is. 
that's just my personal opinion. Yeah, it's like they're using something else to put it, yeah, mirror it into something else that's not even really pertaining to that. So completely agree. Thank you for uh, sharing, though. And I definitely am reading it because I didn't realize that that was a part of the conversation in California. Yeah, I'll definitely um, read it um, tonight. Add it to my reading list. Yeah, well, there, there are all these movements in the states now to ban critical race theory in schools, right? And you know, if you if you wonder, you know, where's that coming from? It's it's because of these excesses. It's that's what people are. Objective. Afraid of mm -hmm. you know, this notion that African American students can't do math, so it's racist to demand that they do it. That's you know that's offensive to me, right? I I don't mm -hmm. buy that for a minute, right? And and nobody should. No, and what I mentioned earlier about the issues with mathematics, um, in the hindrance of 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 being progressive in computer science, um. I believe in that. I believe that there should not be limits placed on um, students who should be able to take computer science classes based off of a prereq of a certain particular mathematics, especially as we're creating foundations in computer science well be before high school. Mm -hmm. so, so I definitely see that those things need to change, but that's not saying that they can't understand mathematics. They're saying that there needs to be a stronger foundation in mathematics. <laughs> and Lynn has dropped a question. Um, do you think the semantics are being compounded by deeply rooted biases? 100%. I'm going to let you guys share your thoughts on that. Oh, are you, are you asking me, Shana? Or? <laughs> yeah, I was asking you and David. Oh, yeah. So um, I know um, that it's like that. Um, I won't like um, call out like a curriculum uh, provider, um, but maybe two years ago, um, I was from school paid for a curriculum provider. Um, they didn't have to. I told them not to, but they did it anyway. Um, so one of the exams um, that my students took, oh gosh, the pass rate probably was like a 30 or 40%. And I was like, I know that my students um, know, you know, the answer. So then after uh, we took the exam, uh, we went over it as a class. And as I was like explaining it in like the language that my students were familiar with, they were answering the questions before I could even finish them. So then I said, okay, well, let me create my own exam. Created, created my own exam, used language that, you know, they were able to um, understand, make sure everything was very, like, culturally relevant. And then the past right on the, that same exam, teaching those same um, clusters of uh, content and information, the past right on that time. So we went from a 30% to a 94%. Mm. And I know that it's all, of, yeah, all about, like, the wording and the semantics of it. Of it all, so I didn't change it. Yeah, I didn't change. Literally, I didn't change anything. Gave them those same different standards. Still made sure I was addressing everything that that quiz um, was addressing, but changed a few words that they were able to understand. And we literally made like a sixty-five percent um, increase. So what does that? So what does that say? What does that mean? We need to 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 change or so like the impact yeah so when we're thinking about these different um curriculums number one even if you are using a block curriculum still make sure that you're doing your part um to make sure that the language is language that you um can understand me um personally what i'm doing to um i guess help the broader scope of things shane is on it as well so we both are um on um the apcsa um advisory um committee so i don't know if you all are familiar with uh code.org apcsa but they are in the process of revamping their ap um csa curriculum to make it more culturally relevant and making sure that there are other um, underrepresented minorities that are taking the courses and they are able to pass the courses. So um, for me, I know it was very um, 
important being an African-American male to make sure that when they are creating this curriculum, make sure that you have that perspective that because there are uh, not that many African-American males in um, education, let alone CS, making sure that um, they are represented because when you look in the classroom, there are a lot of African-American males. So just making sure that I'm doing my part to make sure that the, as um, Lynn alluded to earlier, the semantics are correct the way everyone should be able to, um, when they do sign up for the course, be able to not only sign up for it, but also matriculate and pass through the course. Excellent, excellent, excellent. Does anyone else have any questions or comments or want to come up and share? Well, we are going to drop our information on how you can connect with us in the chat. And I'm also dropping um, this link. Uh, so a few weeks ago, I did an interview with um, Jared from Buddha. Um, it just went live uh, yesterday. So I really um, deep dive, talk about um, like the importance of connecting with your students. And then I also talk about um, me as the uh, state supervisor for South Carolina. Um, what that means and what that looks like um, for the space. I'm also dropping that um, in the chat as well. Shannon, you're on it because I was going to do that too. <laughs> Oh, I, I, I got you. I got you. Why you were talking? Appreciate it. Yeah. So we only have a few more minutes. Um, but thank you all um, for uh, joining us today. Um, again, connect with us on social media. Uh, looking at the weeks ahead, we both will be doing sessions at um, the CSTA conference, which is in about what two, two three weeks. Mm -hmm. um, without giving it away, um, one of the sessions that uh, I'll be a part of is it's a one of a kind session because uh, <laughs> session like this doesn't um, happen um, very often. So um, probably at the beginning of July, uh, you'll see a lot more information about that session. But definitely that's one session that you don't want to miss because I'm not sure how many times that session will ever be happening again. <laughs> I will say definitely be on the lookout for the administrator strand for CSTA. If you are a, a, you're not a member, become a member. It is free. Um, and there will be a chapter leaders summit happening the week before conference. And then again, like I said, an admin strand during conference. Um, so invite your administrators. And if you are a an administrator or a director or a coach, um, definitely attend. We would love to have you. Uh, we want to thank Constellations for accepting our presentation, for us to be able to speak on this today. And all of our presentations, is, we've, we've yes. presented a few times today. Um, thank you again. Follow us on social media. And we hope you guys have a great afternoon. We will be, I'll be tuning in um, to the panel, to the last panel. And uh, the conversation on coded bias. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Take care. Thank you all. Yes, thank you. I think we did really good on time. See, and I was worried that we didn't have enough content, but we, we did it. Just enough time. This is great. You know, it's going to be on, they're going to, Lynn said it's also going to be on YouTube, so we'll be able to see it. Oh, cool. Excellent. I wanted to see the session on esports that was happening at the same time. Yeah. I where was that when I was a kid? That's what I really Right? Think about all the money your parents spent on video games. <laughs> Look, if they had like a little esports like pathway, oh, I would have knocked that off the park. <laughs> That's all kids want to do now is uh, esports. That's yeah. all kids want to do. Not understanding exactly what it is, but they all want to do it. Mm -hmm. I was telling one the other day, it was just amazing how like um, computer science is getting into like the elementary um, space. So I have, uh, you know, I have the two twin nephews. Um, they're six. So 
Um, they're in kindergarten and in their kindergarten class, they're learning how to code. And you know how they're learning how to code? So they, you're, they're using, um, of course, it's block-based coding, uh, but they're associating things with uh, colors. They're very intentional on colors and they're very intentional on their sight words. Mm -hmm. I mean, they made a, an entire game the other day. I was on FaceTime and I was like, how did you like? How y'all make this game? And he was like, oh, it's easy. You do this, this, this. And Thanks, Lynn. I was like, yeah, it's easy. You just do these different things. And then my brother was like, yeah, it's because of the colors. They know the, what those different colors do. And then also because of their sight words. Mm. So, yeah, algorithms at work. Algorithms at work. It's crazy. Yeah. I'm so glad that this worked really well. Uh, thank you, Sababu. I know you there somewhere. <laughs> I know you still there. Look. <laughs> Thank you so much for being our moderator and our support, our technical support. Thank goodness you got my cell phone. <laughs> <laughs> Look, so Bible, you see, I couldn't. Um, you see, I couldn't find the tie in the hotel, but you know. <laughs> Here, let me put mine in the chat, you know, for the next, for the next <laughs> Pass it that way. All right. Pass it that way. <laughs> this was uh, a good we, conversation, though. Y'all did an awesome job. Awesome, awesome, awesome. Great day. You know, y'all did an awesome job. Great job uh, as a small Great team moderating. Yeah, yes. I, I, I can. I, I actually have a computer science implementation workshop that lasts all day. For, for several districts tomorrow, yes. So mm -hmm. we kind of tagged it on to the end of, of um, this summit. Uh, so as a matter of fact, uh, who, who's out there? I, <laughs> so I hope my partner and I out there. I had to finish up one of, one of my um, presentations. I'm doing a micro bit activity, but I'm making it different than the ones I've done in the past. Um, so I'm attempt to do the step counter one. But tell okay. your partner I said hello. <laughs> okay. Well, yeah, I, I could do it, but I had to get finished with the PowerPoints, you know, the documentation to make it a little bit easier for our attendees. <laughs> so yeah, that's our part conference, um, our conference here um, ends tomorrow at 12. And then I'll drive back. And then Thursday, I'll be in um, Charleston um, at the event. And then Friday, I have to um, go security. Um, so like, well, I, I've seen I've seen the work that y'all you know posting and stuff mm -hmm. on Twitter in regards to you know what George is doing in CS. But you know in South Carolina, you know we moving in silence. So just know <laughs> just know that we coming. I'm done with you. Okay. <laughs> I'm done with you. Say like, actually, my partner would probably be your, your counterpart here in Georgia. Right. Uh, Brian, yes. Yep. Yes. Yeah, Brian, you know, I yeah. I'll be. I mean, yeah. I, look, I follow y'all on social, <laughs> but don't can't tell you what we're doing yet. But just, just <laughs> look, just know that we come, come. We'll be right next door. <laughs> gotcha, gotcha, gotcha. <laughs> All right. Well, I'm gonna go ahead and head over to the stage and see. What's going on over there? So I'll I'll be um, you know enjoying the panel too on coded bias. Stayed up with them last night watching it. Uh, had my yes, I can't wait to hear it. To, uh, yeah, I'm gonna, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna watch this yeah, afternoon. Yeah, we're about to head over there as well. Yeah, so I'll see y'all soon. All right, take care. Thanks again, China. Oh look, we need a pick. Oh. Oh oh oh, oh, oh I don't know about that. I don't know about um, put the slide. Look, put the slide on the first one. Okay. Look, it's, look, it's after five now. Oh, <laughs> Wait. oh goodness gracious! Hey, we're cheer. It's cheers time now. Right. Look, it's after five now. <laughs> oh goodness! Oh my goodness! Oh, perfect. Oh, there it is. You got it. Oh, no, not yet. I'm getting everything squeezed onto the screen. <laughs> <laughs> All right. You ready? Yeah. Three, two. Got it. All right. Okay, I'll share it with you. Okay, y'all take care. All right. You too. Talk to you later. Okay, bye bye. Peace.